Uncle Herbert and Aunt Alberta's silver wedding was delicately referred to among the Sterlings during the following weeks as the time we first noticed poor Valency was a little, you understand? Not for worlds would any of the Sterlings have set out and out at first that Valency had gone mildly insane or even that her mind was slightly deranged. Uncle Benjamin was considered to have gone entirely too far when he had ejaculated, she's dippy, I tell you, she's dippy, and was only excused because of the outrageousness of Valency's conduct at the aforesaid wedding dinner. But Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles had noticed a few things that made them uneasy before the dinner. It had begun with the rosebush, of course, and Valency never was really quite right again. She did not seem to worry in the least over the fact that her mother was not speaking to her. You would never suppose she noticed it at all. She had flatly refused to take either purple pills or red ferns bitters. She had announced coolly that she did not intend to answer to the name of Doss any longer. She had told Cousin Stickles that she wished she would give up wearing that brooch with Cousin Artemis Stickles' hair in it. She had moved her bed in her room to the opposite corner. She had read Magic of Wings Sunday afternoon. When Cousin Stickles had rebuked her Valency had said indifferently, Oh, I forgot it was Sunday, and had gone on reading it. Cousin Stickles had seen a terrible thing, she had caught Valency sliding down the banister. Cousin Stickles did not tell Mrs. Frederick this, poor Amelia was worried enough as it was. But it was Valency's announcement on Saturday night that she was not going to go to the Anglican church anymore that broke through Mrs. Frederick's stony silence. Not going to church anymore. Doss, have you absolutely taken leave? Oh, I'm going to church, said Valency airily. I'm going to the Presbyterian church. But to the Anglican church I will not go. This was even worse. Mrs. Frederick had recourse to tears, having found outraged majesty had ceased to be effective. What have you got against the Anglican Church, she sobbed. Nothing, only just that you've always made me go there. If you'd made me go to the Presbyterian Church I'd want to go to the Anglican. Is that a nice thing to say to your mother? Oh, how true it is that it is sharper than a serpent's tooth to have a thankless child. Is that a nice thing to say to your daughter, said unrepentant Valency? So Valency's behavior at the silver wedding was not quite the surprise to Mrs. Frederick and Christine Stickles that it was to the rest. They were doubtful about the wisdom of taking her, but concluded it would make talk if they didn't. Perhaps she would behave herself and so far no outsider suspected there was anything queer about her. By a special mercy of providence it had poured torrents Sunday morning, so Valency had not carried out her hideous threat of going to the Presbyterian Church. Valency would not have cared in the least if they had left her at home. These family celebrations were all hopelessly dull. But the Sterlings always celebrated everything. It was a long-established custom. Even Mrs. Frederick gave a dinner party on her wedding anniversary and Cousin Stickles had friends in to supper on her birthday. Valency hated these entertainments because they had to pinch and save and contrive for weeks afterwards to pay for them. But she wanted to go to the silver wedding. It would hurt Uncle Herbert's feelings if she stayed away, and she rather liked Uncle Herbert. Besides, she wanted to look over all her relatives from her new angle. It would be an excellent place to make public her declaration of independence if occasion offered. Put on your brown silk dress, said Mrs. Sterling. As if there were anything else to put on. Valency had only the one festive dress that snuffy brown silk Aunt Isabel had given her. Aunt Isabel had decreed that Valency should never wear colors. They did not become her. When she was young they allowed her to wear white, but that had been tacitly dropped for some years. Valency put on the brown silk. It had a high collar and long sleeves. She had never had a dress with low neck and elbow sleeves, although they had been worn, even in Deerwood, for over a year. But she did not do her hair pompadour. 
She knotted it on her neck and pulled it out over her ears. She thought it became her, only the little knot was so absurdly small. Mrs. Frederick resented the hair but decided it was wisest to say nothing on the eve of the party. It was so important that Valancy should be kept in good humor, if possible, until it was over. Mrs. Frederick did not reflect that this was the first time in her life that she had thought it necessary to consider Valancy's humors. But then Valancy had never been queer before. On their way to Uncle Herbert's, Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles walking in front, Valancy trotting meekly along behind Roaring Abel drove past them. Drunk as usual but not in the Roaring stage. Just drunk enough to be excessively polite. He raised his disreputable old tartan cap with the air of a monarch saluting his subjects and swept them a grand bow. Mrs. Frederick and Cousin Stickles dared not cut Roaring Abel altogether. He was the only person in Deerwood who could be got to do odd jobs of carpentering and repairing when they needed to be done, so it would not do to offend him. But they responded with only the stiffest, slightest of bows. Roaring Abel must be kept in his place. Valancy, behind them, did a thing they were fortunately spared seeing. She smiled gaily and waved her hand to Roaring Abel. Why not? She had always liked the old sinner. He was such a jolly, picturesque, unashamed reprobate and stood out against the drab respectability of Deerwood and its customs like a flame-red flag of revolt and protest. Only a few nights ago Abel had gone through Deerwood in the wee SMAs, shouting oaths at the top of his stentorian voice which could be heard for miles, and lashing his horse into a furious gallop as he tore along Prim, proper Elm Street. Yelling and blaspheming like a fiend, shuddered Cousin Stickles at the breakfast table. I cannot understand why the judgment of the Lord has not fallen upon that man long ere this, said Mrs. Frederick petulantly, as if she thought Providence was very dilatory and ought to have a gentle reminder. He'll be picked up dead some morning, he'll fall under his horse's hoofs and be trampled to death, said Cousin Stickles reassuringly. Valancy had said nothing, of course, but she wondered to herself if Roaring Abel's periodical sprees were not his futile protest against the poverty and drudgery and monotony of his existence. She went on dream sprees in her blue castle. Roaring Abel, having no imagination, could not do that. His escapes from reality had to be concrete. So she waved at him today with a sudden fellow feeling, and Roaring Abel, not too drunk to be astonished, nearly fell off his seat in his amazement. By this time they had reached Maple Avenue and Uncle Herbert's house, a large, pretentious structure peppered with meaningless bay windows and excrescent porches. A house that always looked like a stupid, prosperous, self-satisfied man with warts on his face. A house like that, said Valancy solemnly, is a blasphemy. Mrs. Frederick was shaken to her soul. What had Valancy said? Was it profane? Or only just queer? Mrs. Frederick took off her hat in Aunt Alberta's spare room with trembling hands. She made one more feeble attempt to avert disaster. She held Valancy back on the landing as Cousin Stickles went downstairs. Won't you try to remember you're a lady, she pleaded. Oh, if there were only any hope of being able to forget it, said Valancy wearily. Mrs. Frederick felt that she had not deserved this from Providence.